letter G. Letter G. <clears throat> oh, others would be lonely when all their friends are gone. My Lord is ever standing by my side. There is a heavy load upon me, and yet I'm pressing on. Because I have a Savior friend and God. Oh, yes, I have somebody with me to share the heavy load. I feel His presence near me every day. And all the trouble overtakes me along life's weary road. I have somebody with me all the way. In bitter toil and sorrow, say that I have somebody with me all the way. Let's turn our Bibles today to James chapter 4. James chapter 4. James chapter 4. You know, it's something interesting to study. Sometimes you have to, as a pastor, take, a, uh, take what's going on in your society and try to bring it down and explain it from a biblical perspective to the church. And as you've probably been noticing, uh, this is what's called Pride Month. That's what the world has been calling this month. And uh, as you look at the scriptures, one of the things you'll notice as you study the word pride, look it up every time it occurs in the Bible. It is never mentioned positively in the scriptures. Never once. You look it up. I put something like that on Facebook. and A Jewish friend uh, said, uh, well, in the Torah. And I said, well, where in the Torah? And she said, well, my rabbi said. Well, no, I said, where is it in the Torah that it says pride is, is good? Someone else said, well, you ought to have pride in yourself. And he quoted some scripture. I said, well, that scripture doesn't say, you know, you ought to have pride in yourself because... If God gives us everything, our abilities and our strength, then all glory goes to Him for anything good that's in my life. And so I guess the, uh, the shock title of the message today, and it's probably not going to go in the direction you think it's going to go after I give the title, is God Hates Pride. God Hates Pride. Now, I'm not popular enough, but, you know, that's one of those things maybe someone would take and crop it and, you know, try to ruin me or something if I was popular enough, but I'm not. But uh, as we think about how the devil operates, sometimes the devil operates very subtly. And he'll try to sneak things in on us. 
and even sneak things into our lives. It operates very subtly, very tricky, very secretly. But other times, the devil acts very boldly. And he operates openly. And anyone who has any sort of biblical discernment can see what Satan is doing. You see that in the world today. You see times at which Satan no longer is hiding himself, but he is just broadcasting. You know, I am the one doing this. Anyone with biblical discernment can figure out sometimes that Satan is up to something. And if there's one word in the Bible that never has a positive connotation, it is the word pride. God hates pride. And when a person or a nation is proud, Satan is in it and destruction is certain. And we go for our text to James chapter number 4. James chapter number 4. And I'll ask you to stand if you're able, and we'll read two verses, verses 5 and 6. Verses 5 and 6. It says, Do you think that the Scripture saith in vain, The Spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, this word pride and proud, they're never used in the Bible in a positive way. And yet oftentimes, even in our vocabulary, as professing Christians, we use those words. And when we use them, we're trying to encourage people. But help us to understand whether therefore we eat or drink or whatsoever we do, we're to do all to your glory, not our glory. Whatsoever our hand finds to do, let us do it with all our might, but let us do it heartily as unto you. Help this preacher today and help us not to get bogged down in the weeds, but help us to see a principle here that pride itself is dangerous. And we need, by your grace and by your spirit, to avoid it like the plague. And if someone here is lost, help that person to realize that we must cast aside pride before we can even be saved. Help this preacher today. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Let's get a little context here for the book of James. In chapter number three, James uh, condemns those who profess to be Christians and yet tear each other apart with their words. You see, the early church was made up of people just like you and me. The early church was made up of people just like the folks who go to churches today. And we know churches. We know professing Christians who find it amusing or, or whatever to tear down one another. And James just puts it where we can understand it. He said a stream is either going to give sweet water or bitter water. It's not going to give both. In the same way, how can a Christian, a true Christian, send forth vile, wicked words and with that same mouth send up praises unto God? <laughs> you know, it just doesn't happen that way. Now, yes, all of us are tempted to say things we shouldn't, but as a pattern of life, we should not have this split personality where we're speaking one way during the week, so to speak, and speaking another way when we come in the presence of God. Okay, that's chapter 3. In chapter 5, James warns that God's judgment is going to fall upon those who trust in their wealth. And especially those who get their wealth 
by crooked means, by wicked means. And so you have on one side people that are tearing each other apart with their words, who profess to be Christians. On the other side, you have people who would say, well, that's my spiritual life, but, but here's my business life, okay? <laughs> They're different, you know, no, no. Christ is Lord of all or Lord of nothing, okay? And so then in chapter 4, right in the middle, this question is asked, from whence come wars and fightings among you? Uh, the word wars here means quarrels. Coming off of chapter number 3, James is asking, you know, why is it? And he's writing a general epistle to the churches. Why is it in so many churches people are fussing and fighting and tearing each other down? Where does this come from? And in churches, in verses 1 through 3 of chapter 4, it says, Come they not hence, even of your own lust, that war in your members? You lust and have not, you kill and desire to have, and cannot obtain. You fight in war. In other words, you're fighting and quarreling all the time. You have not, because you ask not. You ask and receive not, because you ask amiss, that you may consume it upon your lust. This is true in churches, this is true in homes, this is true in workplaces. Why is it there's always conflict? Well, one reason is because of our selfishness and our sinful desire to always have my way, okay? That's where conflicts come from. Always wanting to have my way. Well, another source of these wars and fightings is in verse number four. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Why is there conflict in the church? Why is there conflict in Christian homes? Why is there conflict among the body of Christ? Because worldliness has entered in to the mix. Where does it come from? Your own sinful desires. Where does it come from? The influence of the world. You know, they say that uh, after the first year of marriage, what I was taught is the biggest conflict that, that husbands and wives have is finances. <laughs> it's the biggest conflict. And maybe some, you don't have to say it, but would say in your heart, amen, you know. Well, I want this. Well, I want that. You know, well, you know, the bass boat's what I need. Well, the, the new kitchen is what I need. You know, the women say amen, you know. But everybody has these conflicts of what they need, and it's all because the world says you've got to have it, or it's all because I want it, okay? And that's conflicts in church, in home, and everywhere. Okay, so in verse number five, in the light of sinful desires, and in the light of people in the church playing footsie with the world, verse number five says, Do you think that the Scripture saith in vain, the Spirit that dwelleth in us, Lusteth to envy? When our sinful nature or the world exerts great influence over the Christian, then the Holy Spirit who lives within us becomes jealous. That's what the picture here is. God says, I am a jealous God. We have been purchased with the precious blood of God's Son. We ought to worship and serve Him and Him alone. And yet when we let our sinful desires have reign, or we let this world and its philosophies have reign, the Spirit within us is grieved. And when the Spirit of God is, is grieved, He convicts us. And then we, we were tempted to quench the Spirit and say, well, 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 you know, I'm not going to listen right now. Uh, you know, later, later, later. Uh, and what happens? There's conflict within. You know, there, there are three different kinds of people. There's the lost with, with no religion, no Christianity. And they're living it up. That's all they know. Live it up for today. 
Whatever the world says. There's the saved who's spirit-filled and spirit-led. And they're walking in harmony with their Creator. And they're having that joy unspeakable and full of glory. They're enjoying that peace that passes all understanding. Then there's that middle ground. Some are saved, some are lost. But we're either they're, they're putting themselves under the preaching of God's Word. Maybe they're even reading God's Word. They know what God wants, and yet they continue to fight against it. That is the, the struggle that's going on in verse number 5. But in the midst of that struggle, there's a promise in verse 6. It says, but he, but God giveth more grace. Grace. There are two different meanings that grace has in the scripture based on the context. One is favor, and the other is strength. And so in the midst of the conflict, in this context, it's saying God will give you the strength to overcome those sinful desires and to overcome the pull of the world on your life. There's a reason why the Bible says, and as we study Revelation, we see it over and over and over again. We are overcomers by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But to whom does he give this strength to overcome and to defeat the flesh and to defeat the pull of the world? Well, he goes on in verse 6. Wherefore he saith, and he's quoting from Proverbs 3, 34. It's God speaking through the scriptures. And the first thing he says is negative. God Resisteth the proud. Now some of the young people here are taking Greek with uh, Randy Reagan. And they're probably at a level of Greek that's higher than even I'm at right now. Okay, But they can check out this word in their spare time. Resisteth here. Resist. And the picture that as I study this word that's given here. Is the picture of God putting on his armor and being ready to fight against. God is ready in all of his strength to pick a fight with somebody. Ooh. All-powerful God? Is it smart to pick a fight with him? No, it is not. Well, who is it that God is going to fight against with all of his armor and all of his strength. And the answer here is the proud. Who are the proud? The proud are those who think themselves to be above others. And even, even though they may not say this, above God. They refuse to submit to anybody or anything, even to God and his word, even though they may not say that. They feel self-sufficient. They trust in themselves and despise others. They think or say things like, I don't need anyone. Nobody's going to tell me what to do. I am perfectly all right. I'm okay. I'm okay. Everything's fine. This is what the proud person says. Now as we think about this picture here, every time a person, a company, or a country celebrates pride, this word. We can imagine the Lord Jesus Christ in full body armor, ready to oppose that person, that company, or that country. Because God resisteth 
the proud. Proverbs 8, 13 says, The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Pride and arrogancy and the evil way and the froward mouth do I hate. If you want to fear God, if you want to honor God, you're going to hate evil. And what is the root of most of the evil in our lives and in this world? Pride. And the second thing is arrogancy. <laughs> Nobody's going to tell me what to do. <laughs> okay. Look at Leviticus 26. Leviticus 26. Beginning of verse 14. But if you will not hearken unto me, God speaking, and will not do all these commandments, and if you shall despise my statutes, or if your soul abhor my judgments, so that ye will not do all my commandments, but that ye break my covenant, I also will do this unto you. God says, you don't do what I say, Israel. Here's what I'm going to do. I will even appoint over you terror, consumption, and the burning ague that shall consume the eyes and cause sorrow of heart. You shall sow your seed in vain, for your enemies shall eat it. I will set my face against you. You shall be slain before your enemies. They that hate you shall reign over you, and ye shall flee when none pursueth you. And if you will not yet, for all this, hearken unto me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins. And here is why God sends these judgments. Verse 19. And I will break the pride of your power. I will make your heaven as iron and your earth as brass. Now the picture of that is, I'm not going to send any rain. And not going to be any crops growing because there's no rain. That's the picture of that there in that verse. And your strength shall be spent in vain, for your land shall not yield her increase, neither shall the trees of the land yield their fruits. If we are too proud to obey omnipotent God, all powerful God, if we're too stupid to not obey, all-powerful God, then he will set his face against us and break the pride of our power. Let me tell you something. God is not going to let anybody rebel against him and get away with it. He is a jealous God. He gave us our lives. He sent his son to save us from our sin. And he's not going to put up with it. He's not going to put up with it. Psalm 18. Psalm 18, verses 26 and 27. And when we look at how God dealt with Israel, we see how God deals with the nation in that way. Psalm 18, verses 26 and 27. The psalmist says, With the pure, thou wilt show thyself pure, and with the froward, thou wilt show thyself froward. For thou wilt save the afflicted people, but will bring down high looks. High looks. That caught my attention. You know there's been a change just looking in the faces of people. You know, it used to be that if someone was disobeying God's law, you talk to them about it. And they'd say something like, well, I know, preacher. I know, preacher. I'm just not doing right. I know I need to change. I, I know, I know, I know. But now, there's been a change. There's no shame. And people brag about their sin. There's no shame. They'll tell you. Yeah, yeah, I'm doing that. You gotta give you that look like you got a problem with it? 
Who are you to tell me what to do? Well, let me quote the scripture. I don't care how you interpret that book. No, just, just, I'm just going to quote the scripture, you know. And even if they don't say it, there's that look. When you try to tell them what's right and what's wrong, it's that blank stare of, you're not going to tell me what to do. I'm in charge of my own life. That's where we're at. And it says here that when their high looks, that God is going to bring them down. You know, I hear our president talk. And I'd say this about any president. But he says, this is America. We can do anything. This is America. We can do anything. He says that quite a bit or something like that. Well, Mr. President, if God does not show favor to America, and if we continue to have a proud attitude and rebel against him, then Mr. President, with all due respect, he can shut her down. He can collapse this nation. And, you know, and it's on both sides. Oh, this is America. We're going to be here forever. Greatest nation on the earth. Biggest military on the earth. Well, what does the psalmist say? Don't trust in horses and chariots. Today that would be tanks and missiles, you know. But trust in the Lord. Only in the Lord is safety and prosperity. Look at Isaiah chapter 2. Isaiah chapter 2. This is a theme throughout the scriptures. That's what I'm trying to show you. Isaiah chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. It says, The lofty looks, there it is, of man shall be humbled. The haughtiness of men, which is the pride of men, shall be bowed down. And the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. For the day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon everyone that is proud and lofty, and upon everyone that is lifted up, and he shall be brought low. The day of the Lord, the day of God's judgment, What's going to happen? The proud will be brought low. Proverbs 16. Proverbs 16. This is one of the more quoted verses when it comes to pride. Proverbs chapter 16. Verses 18 and 19. Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. Better it is to be of a humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. What does pride do to a person, to a nation? It destroys. It destroys. Look at Isaiah 14. Isaiah 14. We see here in Isaiah 14 the father of pride, Satan himself. And yes, the prophet was likely talking about Babylon here, but as often is the case with prophecy, and especially Babylon, which represents this world system that sets itself up against Almighty God, we see here Satan, the father of pride. Verse 3, And it shall come to pass in the day that the Lord shall give thee rest from thy sorrow, from thy fear, from the hard bondage wherein thou wast made to serve. He's talking to God. God is talking to his people. There's coming a day of relief. He's talking to his people today. Babylon, this world system that sets itself up against God and his anointed, is one day going to be destroyed. Yes, the wicked may seem to prosper, but one day they're going to be destroyed. Verse 4. That thou shalt take up this proverb against the king of Babylon, and say, How hath the oppressor ceased, the golden city ceased? The Lord hath broken the staff of the wicked, and the scepter of the rulers. Think of Satan here, the ultimate king of Babylon. He who smote the people in wrath and a continual stroke, he that ruled the nations in anger, is persecuted and none hindereth. The whole earth, look forward to this day, is at rest and is quiet. They break forth into singing. 
Yea, the fir trees rejoice at thee, and the cedars of Lebanon, saying, Since thou art laid down, no feller is come up against us. The word feller. <laughs> but anyway, uh, we see here, like in Revelation, Babylon the Great has fallen, has fallen. There's joy that Babylon is fallen. Verse 9. Hell from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. It stirreth up the dead for thee, even all the chief ones of the earth. It hath raised up from their thrones all the kings of the nations. And they shall speak and say unto thee, just imagine seeing Satan being thrown into the lake of fire. Art thou also become weak as we? Art thou become like unto us? Thy pomp is brought down to the grave. The noise of thy, thy vials. The worm is spread under thee. And the worms cover thee. Ooh. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, is this the man that made the earth to tremble? That did shake kingdoms? That made the world as a wilderness? And destroyed the cities thereof? That opened not the house of his prisoners? We see here in this passage, the father of pride, Satan himself. We hear in his voice the cry of today, I will be like the Most High. But what is the end of Satan and all who follow his example? Thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. You know, Satan has peddled this lie ever since the beginning. In the Garden of Eden, what did Satan say? He said, Ye shall not surely die. But if you eat of the tree of the knowledge of the fruit of the good and evil, your eyes shall be open, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. What does pride say? 